Corner. Welcome to Future Talk. On today's program, we're going to talk about the Internet of Things, which is the growing trend to connect just about everything, including inanimate objects, to the Internet. What would a totally connected world look like? What are the potential benefits, and what are the possible risks? That's what I'll be discussing with my three guests. Stephen Eglash is executive director of the Secure Internet of Things project at Stanford University. Much of his work involves bridging the gap between university research and private industry. Previously, he was president and CEO of Cerium Technologies, a solar energy company. Philip Levis is an associate professor of computer science and electrical engineering at Stanford and co-director of the Secure Internet of Things project. The results of his research are used by thousands of people, run on hundreds of thousands of devices, and are the basis for Internet standards that he has co-authored. Keith Winstein is an assistant professor of computer science at Stanford, where his work centers on advanced networking and Internet security. Previously, he spent three years as a staff reporter for the Wall Street Journal. He also served as vice president of a startup company that was acquired by Oracle Corporation, and I would like to welcome all three of you to the program today. It's great to be Thanks here. having us. Yes, thank you. Steve, let me start with you. What, broadly speaking, is the Internet of Things? I have a vague idea, but I'm not really sure what it's about. It's all about connecting all kinds of things in the physical world to the Internet. So it's the Internet of Things as opposed to the Internet of finance or social relationships or airline reservations. Instead, it's measuring temperatures or where people are or pollutants in the air and that sort of thing. What's exciting about it is it's an opportunity to get data on the real world, on people, on the environment, that sort of thing. So almost anything literally like these water glasses could be uh, at attached to the internet? They could have a little device stuck to them that would report everything about them? That's the whole idea, that by having a sensor that measures some property and a radio that can communicate data, you have the ability for things to be connected. A lot of things are connected already. Those smartphones we all carry around have lots of sensors, and they're certainly connected to the internet. Our automobiles are. Lots of other things are. Now, Phil, we're talking a little bit about sensors because the Internet of Things means that you have a sensor gathering information. I understand there's been a lot of progress in sensor development recently. Could you briefly say, well, how does a sensor work and what are the current capabilities of our modern sensors? Well, sensors, there's a huge variety of them that can sample all kinds of things, ranging from magnetic fields to gyroscopes, accelerometers, temperature, humidity, different kinds of solar radiation, like, say, photosynthetically active radiation versus total solar radiation. What's really been pushing the Internet of Things forward, though, is that, you know, basically starting with the iPhone and the creation of smartphones, there was this huge market push to reduce the cost and, and size and power draw and increase the fidelity, the precision of these sensors. And so suddenly, because of that push from the smartphone market, sensors that used to cost maybe 50 cents are now 3 cents. And you can have sensors, say, that are so sensitive, uh, a gyroscope on a modern smartphone is so sensitive, even though it's cheap and so low power, that it can sort of hear what people are saying by vibrations of itself from sound waves and from that you can actually maybe tell what people are saying by sampling a gyroscope. So these sensors gather information and then they have an internet connection maybe through a nearby Wi-Fi and that information goes somewhere and maybe nobody looks at it immediately but it's stored away and it's accessible to anybody. Well, that's possible. It depends on you know what that sensor, how it's connected to the internet. Uh, there are lots of cases where that data is public, um, but usually when you buy an Internet of Things device today, it's not public. It's part of an application that some company sells you. For example, when you buy your, uh, like I say, a Fitbit um, that's tracking you as a, as a health monitor sort of activity, uh, the data isn't being dumped out onto a public server. Instead, it's going to Fitbit servers, where then you can access it, and the apps on your phone can access it. And what are some of the uh, uses of these sensors connected to the Internet that you know, might not be immediately obvious to people? Uh, well, so one is there was this big push you know, uh, in California tor towards smart meters, these meters that rather than somebody walking by a house once a month to read the meter and write down a number, you could actually make them have sensors and wirelessly connect them. And so that's today, uh, you know, for example, my uh, apartment uh, at home uh, has uh, a smart meter. 
And so rather than someone coming by and reading the sensor, it's wirelessly communicating through a multi-hop mesh through much of the city of San Francisco. And now sampling rather than once a month, it's sampling every four or five minutes. And you can log on to your account and see sort of minute by minute what your power use is. You can see that, aha, when I wake up and turn on the heater, then suddenly I'm spending five times as much for electricity versus when nobody's home and it's just the refrigerator. Well, that's about $10 a month to run a refrigerator. Now, Keith, I understand that there are a lot of security issues, security concerns with the Internet of Things. All of you are associated with a group called the Secure Internet, Project, Internet of Things Project at Stanford. What are some of the security issues that we have to be concerned about? Well, you know, I'm kind of the naysayer of this group. Uh, Every group <laughs> needs one. You know, I, I think any time... You know, I think it remains to be seen what the impact of the Internet of Things, uh, of connecting everyday things, will be. You know, you have, a, you have a blender, maybe you connect the blender to the Internet. Maybe, you know, does that matter at all? It's not that clear to me. One thing we worry about is if everything is connected together and connected to the Internet, it creates a sort of monoculture, a sort of societal dependence. And you have to worry about what might happen if, if, you know, if something happened to every toaster or every blender, every car at the same time. That could be pretty bad. You know, if suddenly every Toyota stopped in its tracks, you know, either because of a bug or because of a, a bad person or a bad government, uh, you know, it would be really bad if every, every car of a certain make just suddenly stopped. So does that mean that maybe we're relying too much on the Internet and if suddenly it all crashed, which is hard to do because it is a network, so if part of it comes down, the rest might stay up, but the part that you're on might come down. Um, is there a risk that the Internet might fail us at some point and everything that we depend on won't be there? You know, I think there's a risk if you have everything talking to everything else and everything connected to, to one another, to each other, that, that increases the sort of correlation of failure. So, you know, if you know, used to maybe generate your own lighting, you know, you had a, a lamp, you know, in your house with, uh, you know, with, uh, you know, fuel for it. This is going back, you know, a while. And now, you know, now we're connected together in the electrical grid. That's good in one sense, but also it creates a sort of group dependence. You know, the power can go out for a whole city. The lighting can go out for a whole city in a way that, you know, wouldn't be when everyone was, was individually reliant. So if you think about, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh. Now, some people have expressed concern about what's been called a surveillance state. Maybe you've thought somewhat about this. Uh, where the government tracks every movement and knows everything you've ever done? Or is that a concern where your whole life is simply an open book to anyone who might want to control you? Any, either one of you could answer. I, oh, I mean, I, I think that's uh, absolutely um, a concern um, in the sense of what is being collected us, about us and, and what, for what ends. Um, now, on one hand, I think making security measures that are robust to uh, state actors is very, very hard. Um, but I think certainly since things like the Snowden revelations, that's something which a lot of security researchers have begun to think about. Uh, for example, post-Snowden, one of the things that the Internet Engineering Task Force, the IETF, the people who design the Internet protocols, uh, they have now stated that uh, they consider passive surveillance of all communication as an active attack that protocols need to be aware of and defend against. Um, and so I think that is absolutely of people's uh, concern. One, yeah, go ahead. One area that we put some thought into is just the question of the, the fact that we often, we don't know what our own devices are saying about us. So if you buy an internet-connected refrigerator or an in internet-connected toaster or blender or a, a, an automobile or any other, we have some Internet of Things products here, we, we can talk about it, Internet of Things smoke detector or a, a camera or a power outlet. You buy these devices and you put them in your house but you don't know what these devices are saying about you. So, you know, we've got the smoke detector here. We don't know what the smoke detector is, is telling. This is a Nest smoke detector. We don't know what the smoke detector is telling Nest about us. It communicates with, with its manufacturer uh, on a regular basis. We don't know what it's saying. So maybe it's surveilling us, maybe it isn't, but we, we don't even know. Are there any standards, like uh, when you purchase food, there's supposed to be a label telling you what all the ingredients are. When you purchase an electronic device, uh, is there a little sticker that tells you what all its capabilities are of spying on you? Or should there be? Yes, I don't think there are any government uh, regulations in that regard. Um, but I think one of the interesting things that uh, especially Keith has discoveries does, dug into this is that often can be that a company will state that they're doing one thing, but then some engineer or for whatever reason, it actually turns out it's doing something slightly different. I mean, there have been cases where, for example, uh, for uh, web browsers where 
Uh, they said, well, if you want to disable cookies who can't be tracked, please do this. But then the actual code for that uh, service provider, for that application on the web, uh, knew how to hack a little bug in Safari such that they could still track you. Um, and so they were still tracking you. So Google, for example, got in big trouble for doing this. Some Google engineers found a bug in Apple's web browser, Safari, and they exploited the bug to track Macintosh users, Apple users, even though Google said it wasn't tracking those users. Google had to pay, you know, $35 million. And so part of what we try to do with our research group is identify these potential threats and then try to engineer solutions to mitigate them. So to the point we were talking about earlier, where you worry what a device might be saying about you. Is a device communicating the information that it was intended to communicate, or perhaps something it shouldn't be communicating? Keith and his coworkers have developed engineering and software that allows a user to know what the device is saying about him or her. It gives you the ability to monitor whether you're being tracked or not, and if the tracking is accurate and appropriate. So you're not controlling it, but at least you know what it is, which is a big step. Well, and in fact, that's a key feature, and that's part of what makes the development of these sorts of software tools difficult, not straightforward. If you buy a Nest thermostat, you shouldn't be able to alter what Nest learns about you, but you should be able to know what Nest learns about you. And so we take those sorts of considerations uh, into the work. And speaking of Nest thermostats, I think we have one right over there. We, we don't have a thermostat. We have a Nest smoke detector. Okay. It's an internet-connected smoke detector. It, uh, you know, it talks to the internet every, every day or so, and, and you can check it from a smartphone and see if the battery is still good or if there's a fire, you know, that kind of thing. So there is a reason why you would want your smoke detector to be uh, internet-connected. So yeah. if it went off and you were a thousand miles away, maybe you would get an alarm on your phone. Your house is burning down. Yes, I don't know that that's that useful. I mean, it should call the fire department. But yeah, if the if the battery is getting low, that's that's something that you'd want to know about. And uh, yeah, but you might not know, for example. So this smoke detector, you know, it, it communicates with Nest. Marty, who, how do you think it does that? Do you think it talks directly to Nest? Um, I have no idea. Maybe it goes through Wi-Fi. Maybe it's sending it to Nest. Yeah. So that you're yeah. right. It, it goes through Wi-Fi. But it turns out we learned by examining this, it's actually talking to Amazon because this product is built on top of Amazon's uh, cloud computing. So it's a, it's a sister company of Google, but it doesn't use Google's cloud computing, it uses Amazon's. So the Nest uh, smoke detector and the Nest camera are actually sending your data to Amazon, and then from there, maybe to Google, maybe not. You have a Nest camera over there, too. What we is, do, yeah. This how is, is a, that different? For, is that the one you have in your house so you can see what your house looks like when you're not home? <laughs> Yeah, exactly. It's a security camera. It talks over Wi-Fi. It turns out it actually talks to Amazon, sends video from your house. And, and you can monitor that from a smartphone, from a computer. Now, could we have, like, swarms of Internet-enabled devices? Like, let's say you have an earthquake zone. You just drop these sensors out of a helicopter over an area of miles, and you have maybe thousands of these devices. And any motion that any of them detect, you can keep a very precise record of Earth movements over a wide area to see when you might have the next earthquake. Well, it's, it's a great example. You could imagine, as you described, Marty, a network of sensors to give you the first indication of Earth movement. And as you know, there are some geologists who think that can give you a few seconds warning of a coming large earthquake. Then if you have internet-connected valves on your natural gas lines, that might give you time to close those valves so as to minimize the chance of a fire and explosion. And in a disaster scenario, you could imagine all these internet-connected devices helping with disaster response to find out where people are trapped, to find out where fires are that might be propagating to de-energize uh, electrical lines that have fallen. Now, there's a theory that when the whole world is connected to the internet, a sort of uh, large collective mind is going to come out of this? Is that total science fiction, or do you think there's some validity, like each one of us will be like one little neuron in a big interconnected brain? Uh, I think the people who propose that kind of a future uh, haven't been very far outside of Silicon Valley. The world is very different and very varied. Uh, the singularity or the post-physical transcendence to digital existence is not going to happen because of the Internet of Things. I feel quite confident in that. So. Now, so what is the ultimate direction of the Internet of Things? Like, let's say nothing interfered with the development and everyone did the research. I mean, what would be the ultimate you know, benefit of all this? Well, I'm sure we all have different thoughts on it. I'll give it a try first. I think what we'll see 
as this trend continues over five or 10 or 20 years, is a physical world that's increasingly anticipating our needs. So uh, whether we're talking about your health care or your transportation or your interaction with the environment, we're going to imagine a system that is increasingly understanding what you need, when you need it, and anticipating that. Even now, most of us are carrying a smartphone where when we get into our car at a given time of day, the smartphone knows where you're likely to go. Are you likely to go home? Are you likely to go to work? And it tells you how long that trip's going to take based on the traffic at that moment. Imagine that sort of effect on steroids. Mm. Now, will we have health devices too, or maybe it's like your watch, it constantly monitors your heart rate and blood pressure and all these vital signs and sends that information somewhere. And someone in a little cubicle is watching this over the large population saying, oh, that guy there looks like he might have a heart attack at any minute. Well, or, or perhaps even more insidious, uh, you and I might go have a cocktail when the show is over tonight and that device you talked about may tell your insurance company that you're drinking and raise your rates. So we can certainly imagine all kinds of inappropriate uses of these devices and as consumers, as people who speak to regulators, we need to make sure that doesn't happen. Now you're involved in both the private sector and uh, the university sector um, and you sort of try to bridge the gap between the two. So what's the relationship at Stanford? I mean, is, is the private sector funding the work? How, how does something go from a Stanford lab to a commercial product that somebody can buy? You're really asking about the innovation process. And if what you want to do is have, do impactful research, if what you want to do is change the world for the better, there's a role for both industry and academia. What we try to do at Stanford is facilitate a conversation where industry is talking about the problems and challenges and opportunities they see in the real world. That can inform and influence and inspire the research we do. The researchers, like Phil and Keith and their students, talk about their innovations and their developments and their inventions. And as those things reach maturity, industry is often the institution that has the resources for large-scale impact. Now, is the Internet of Things something that we expect to penetrate worldwide, where we like to think the United States is the center of things? But this sounds like maybe it'll get into the deepest jungles of you know, sub-Saharan Africa, or, and it'll affect people really on a worldwide basis. You know, I think what Steve has, has said, um, you know, I, I think what we're seeing is that the, the price of internet connectivity, of connecting anything to the internet, is going down more and more. So there's sort of no reason not to connect things to the internet. Uh, you know, you get a toothbrush or a, a car or a blender, almost anything you buy might be connected to the internet. So in that sense, it probably will penetrate everywhere. Whether it makes a difference to anyone, I think, remains to be seen. Uh, you know, I think there are possible uses in disasters. There's possible uses, uh, benefits to health care uh, that we might have by having these devices become more, more connected. But I don't think we know yet. So penetration, yes. Benefit, I, I, I think, is uncertain. But I do <laughs> like Marty's question. Is this just going to be something for the wealthiest parts of the world, or mm. is it also going to be for resource-poor parts of the world? I was just thinking of an example in watershed management in India. Watershed management, as you know, is trying to think about the sources of water, the uses of water, the reservoirs of water as an integrated system. In order to do watershed management, you need data, which can come from sensors on the ground, satellite imagery, and other things. You need to also modify the behavior of people. Where are they putting their wastewater? Where are they getting their drinking water? How are they irrigating crops? This is a great opportunity for the Internet of Things to help some of the poorest and neediest people on the planet with something they really need. So it could help educate them or just give them feedback like uh, you're putting that garbage in the wrong spot. It's going to get into the water system. You should move it over there. But it can also be more immediate, more real time, and more actionable than that. You can, for example, make sure that during the monsoon season, rainwater is being diverted to a place where you can collect it so you have access to it during the dry season. So it's the sort of thing that it gives you the big picture. You have a lot of information about a lot of people and you aggravate it, aggregate it uh, to uh, see widespread patterns of behavior that are not visible from ground level. 
I, I think that's absolutely right, is that what we're really talking about is today, you know, we can look at the world and we have all kinds of hypotheses, but we kind of have to guess and maybe we poke at it in some way and we have some high level measurement to figure out whether there was an effect. But once we can measure the physical world at a very fine temporal and physical scale, then suddenly, you know, there's reason, right? We can quantify the effects of particular actions or not. Um, here's a simple example. Uh, since, you know, with the drought uh, in California, you know, until this year, or so in the Bay Area until this year with all these rains, but Stanford was very, very concerned about minimizing its, its water use, conservation policies. And so I started a project with a collaborator uh, in earth sciences, Noah Diffenbaugh, uh, to try to figure out, are there things that we could do to get people to use less water um, in the dormitories at Stanford? Today, for each dormitory, basically what you get is a bill at the end of the month that says, this is how much water the dorm used. And from that, it's very, very difficult to disambiguate, like what was showers or what was dishwashers, what was, you know, all the different uses that there might be. So what we did is we built a, a small sort of self-powered water sensor that can measure water flow and temperature, and we instrumented some of the dormitories to see when do people take showers or use the faucets and for how long. And one of the interesting results that came out of it was that some of the showers had a little placard hanging on them, sort of like a, a parking sticker or, you know, a um, yeah, parking permit uh, that said, hey, please save water. And it turns out that the showers where that was hanging, on average, were about a minute shorter, about 12%. And here's this example of, you know, they put this up there, they didn't know if they had an effect. We can now say that there is an effect, that this is helpful, whereas perhaps some other interventions, such as putting something on the door of the of the bathroom where by the time the person takes the shower they've forgotten are not effective. But now that we can quantify the world, we can begin to actually improve it. So it makes everything scientific. Well, a good type of quantification would be studying the atmosphere. How much carbon dioxide is in each cubic meter of air near where you are? If we had sensors everywhere measuring carbon dioxide levels at ground or other types of pollutants, I understand some sensors are quite sensitive. Uh, so would that make people say, well, I didn't realize that there was so much carbon dioxide and coming out of my car? I think the answer is very clear, no. <laughs> well, well I, I have a contrary example. Right. Actually, so the, well, the, the first the thing I did when I went to college, my first research project, my first uh, semester there, uh, was we had an environmental sensor, which was this huge box, you know, this big and this deep. We had to clug it in a suitcase. Nowadays, you know, I can do it with, you know, something smaller than one of these widgets. Um, and uh, it measured carbon dioxide and all these other pollutants, and we put it near bus stops. We put it in the classroom. What we found is that the carbon dioxide level in the classroom increased significantly throughout the day. And so suddenly, you know, we had this hypothesis. Maybe this is why students are sleepy in the afternoon, because there are many other reasons. But the fact that the carbon dioxide level was going up showed there wasn't sufficient ventilation in this particular classroom. So you get carbon dioxide when people breathe. Yes, yeah, because yeah, they're breathing in it. But, but, you know, it just Stop wasn't breathing circulating. breathing so much. Yeah. Right, and or stop showing up to class. And mm -hmm. of course, we are starting to see air quality monitors that people can carry around with them, connected to their smartphone, or that are mounted on lampposts in cities. And the first step in solving any problem is to have data on what the nature of the problem is. You can only manage it if you can measure it. So you've got to start by collecting the data. There may then be challenges in actually modifying and influencing behavior. Just having the data may not lead to better behavior but it's still a necessary first step. Especially if people are public spirited. Now, what is the potential harm like if you have some really nasty people who say, well, my goal is to dominate the world and any tool that I can use to get there, I'll do it. So what could this technology do in the wrong hands, worst case? Well, for example, uh, you know, many of these Internet of Things devices, they're, they're very cheap consumer products. These are sort of low margin uh, electronics that are shipped in they're manufactured in large quantities and shipped here. And they're not, uh, it's not like a computer where it might receive regular security updates from the manufacturer. You know, this is something that's stamped out by a factory somewhere and shipped and then sort of forgotten about by the manufacturer. So often these devices are, the software on them is just empirically really bad uh, and quite vulnerable. Uh, you know, even, even Microsoft has trouble keeping Windows up to date and ahead of, ahead of attackers. If you think of a company that's selling the whole device for $5 and, you know, the software part of that was $0.10 cents and the margin was, was less than that, they're not going to have the budget to invest in sort of continually keeping it secure. So we know this because uh, what happens is these devices, it could be a, a light bulb or a, a power outlet, they become attacked by bad people on the Internet and they become part of what's called a, a botnet. So your light bulb in your house might unwittingly be part of a, a mob of millions of these, you know, evil light bulbs all across the, the world. This sounds like, you know, like out of a book, but it, this really happened. 
And uh, what happens is if you write an, an essay on the web, you know, something that, that Russian mobsters don't like or someone doesn't like, they commandeer these millions of light bulbs uh, to all attack the web server that's hosting this, this speech. And so this really happened. There's something called the Mireille botnet. And uh, millions of light bulbs all around the world and, and little cameras and all kinds of cheap you know, electronic junk all attacked one website and brought it down. Uh, one website with speech that whoever was paying for this didn't like. Or actually, you know, this, is, uh, this past fall, uh, I teach the uh, introduction to computer networks class. So how does the internet work and, and what are its principles? And you know, it was great because mid-quarter, uh, there was that attack on uh, the Dyn servers, so Dyn DNS servers uh, uh, on the East Coast and then the Center and the West Coast of the United States. There was this period when like PayPal and a bunch of other high-profile sites went down for the day because someone basically paid some money to take a, about a fifth of this Mirai botnet and use it to attack these you know, core servers on the Internet that let people find uh, where, you know, say, PayPal was being, you know, what computers you could contact for PayPal. And so it's exactly this case of a bunch of webcams and sort of home Wi-Fi routers that have very poor security policies and were never being updated uh, could all be commandeered and then be used as an attack, as a, you know, actually as a weapon to bring down a whole bunch of major companies for a day. So that would be a denial of service attack. Yeah. Massive computer power distributed over a wide area, all directed at the same target. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And you talk about the power grid. The power grid is all part of the internet. You know, how much, how, we only have about half a minute left, but can you tell me the total effect on the power grid if it got into the wrong hands in 30 seconds? Well, a lot of people use electricity, Marty. Yeah, electricity, electricity is important. It's, a problem. So. it's important Depends for hospitals, that. important for ventilators, yeah. important for a lot of stuff. Yeah. Yeah, so we, uh, so it sounds like we have some challenges, and it's good that you guys are working on this. It's the Secure Internet of Things project, so security is really the main purpose of this project that you're all working on. Uh, do you feel you can stay ahead of the bad guys? Are you optimistic that uh, good guys will win? Well, we've done a good job of explaining what the threats are. The good news is that having identified the threats, there are now a lot of people, including us, at work on finding the right protection against those threats. Okay, I'm because that'll have to be a subsequent. Yeah, that'll have to be because we're totally out of time. Thank you for watching. Visit our website, www.futuretalk.net. For Future Talk, I'm Marty Wasserman, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.